steps, but it really echoes. Oh, no, I got the same one so. I mean, well, it's always good to be able to share the gospel, I mean, with people, I mean, especially on a uh, college campus. And, uh, as the brother was saying, uh, as, we, as we walked up, a college campus is a place where ideas should be shared. You may disagree. Oh, with us, you, uh, we may disagree with you, but it's a uh, it's a place where ideas, you know, people should come together to share ideas. I mean, and, and really, as the brother mentioned, you know, it was th those ideas. I mean, that someone else brought it uh, actually and, uh, eventually can you know uh, convince him of the gospel, convince him of Jesus Christ. I mean, and I was convinced at one point too. I, I was you know, my background is different. However, I had to be convinced. It's not blind faith. I mean, when I weighed the evidence of who Jesus Christ was, I mean, what he did, the historical accuracy of the of the Gospels, of the Bible, I mean, the fact that Christ fulfilled uh, the Old Testament prophecies of being the Messiah, the fact that he died on the cross and was risen again, resurrected, the fact that people saw that, eyewitnesses, over 500 eyewitnesses uh, to that, uh, fact alone, I mean, it convinced me that you know Christ was the Messiah and is the Messiah and is the Savior. And he was real. I mean, and he did die for you and I. He did die for our sins. He he did propitiate for our sins. So so that being the case, Amen. Uh, I reasoned with God. Amen. I realized that my sins, like the Bible says, was. Uh, the, the working of iniquity. It was the breaking of God's law. I mean, it put me in enmity with God. It put me in a hostile place with God. It made me God's enemy. I mean, I, I come to that conclusion. I realize if I did not turn from those sins, I mean, I would not inherit eternal life. That I would go to hell. I mean, so I made the decision to follow Jesus Christ and turn from my sins, to turn from my wickedness, to turn from the way I was living. I mean, to turn from my perversions and my uh, my evil deeds and turn my life to Jesus Christ, I repented. I mean, I had a change of mind about those things. I had a change of mind about those sins. Not just unbelief, but a, a change of mind of the way I was living. I mean, I realized the way I was living was not only detrimental to my physical uh, well-being and my, my physical body, but it was also going to be a detrimental detrimental to my spiritual well-being you see scripture says that the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life the payment for being a fornicator the payment for being a homosexual the payment for being a thief the payment for being a reviler the payment for being a drunkard the payment for being a porn watcher and a pot smoker and any other sin is death. That's what you get. Amen. That's what you reap. When you sow those things, you reap the results of those things. And the result of that is death. Amen. Whatsoever a man soweth, that he also shall reap. <clears throat> so when you sow to the flesh, when you sow to the things that go against God, when you partake and promote and, and, and live out the things that goes against God's law and then you reap his justice system and then you, you reap the punishment that he set forth for that amen he is a just God don't forget that God he is a just God and he does have a law he's actually given us a law book amen he's written it out in word it tells us amen uh, his morality amen he's also put it in your heart amen he's given you a conscience I mean, he's given you uh, 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 something to know that knows the difference between right and wrong. You know inherently, I mean, whether you uh, deny that or not, you know inherently that things are wrong. I mean, that's one reason there's such a push in, in today's society with the LGBTQ agenda is a lot of them, they most of them, they know it's wrong. They know it's wrong to live that way. They know it's wrong to per partake in those actions. Amen. And, and, to, and to commit those foul, foul, foul deeds and those decadent deeds. I mean, they know what's wrong. I mean, and they try to soothe their conscience. They try to get everyone to accept them. 
They've been, and they try to push their agenda in order. A lot of it's in order to ease their conscience. Amen. But I don't care how many people here in America accept it, how many states or how, how much the federal, how many laws the federal government passes. I mean, it will never be right. Those things will never be just. They'll never be holy. God will never condone it. It's always going to be condemned in God's word. It's always going to be an abomination in God's word. I mean, it's always going to be something that God detests. And it's not, that's not the only sin, you know, that seems to be it's what our society focuses on now. You know, most of the time we get we get questioned a lot about it. I mean, we can be preaching on anything. And, you know, when we're downtown a lot, people <laughs> they seem that they always want to ask that. So that lets me know that it's on people's conscience. It bothers their conscience that they're living that way. I mean, or, 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 or that they, they, they are accepting that. Amen. But that being the case, folks, that being the case, even though it, it is a vile sin, even though your fornication as well, even though it, it's a vile sin, your drunkenness, it's a, it's a vile sin. When you take God's name in vain, any of those things God consider, he considers it, it, it vile and unclean. Amen. He has made a way for you to be clean. He's made a way for you to have those sins forgiven. He's made a way so that you could be washed clean, that you could be made whole. I mean, that you could be sanctified and that you could be made righteous. I mean, he did that I mean, by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you. I mean, that spotless lamb. I mean, that, the one that, that's uh, worthy of all praise, that, that holy one. Christ, sent, Christ came down. God sent him to die for you, to be a sacrifice for you. I mean, he bore the sins of this world. He bore them. He took on sin. He became sin. Amen. So that you could have freedom, so that you could have liberty, so that you could be born again, so that you could have eternal life. Amen. That's something that you can have. Amen. But if you're living in sin, you don't have it, folks. I don't care if you go to church. I don't care if you go to the Wesley Foundation or, or any of these other groups here on campus. If you're living in sin, you don't know Jesus Christ. You don't know God. Amen. You haven't turned your life to him. You're not following him. If you're partaking in those things, you don't know who God is. The Bible says in 1 uh, John 3 and 8, He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. He that is born of God doeth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, for he is born of God. I mean, that's the scripture, folks. That's what the Word of God says. I know that's not really preached in many churches. You're probably not going to hear those scriptures preached at the Wesley Foundation. You're not going to hear those scriptures preached about at the, at, at the church and, and many other churches in this area. I mean, why? Because, well, they preach something different. They preach something that's totally unbiblical. They'll say that you can't help but sin all the time. That, you, that you're just going to live in darkness no matter what. I mean, it's just a part of you. It's just who you are. I mean, well, I beg to differ. If you become a child of God, if you become uh, one of his uh, uh, blood-bought, born-again believers in him, a child of his, I mean, you're going to be set free from this world. You're going to be washed clean. You're going to be made new. I mean, though your sins are scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they'll be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I see that's in the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. That's foreshadowing, foreshadowing what the blood of Jesus Christ can do for you and will do if you turn your life with him, if you'll be willing to reason with God. Amen. If you'll be willing to talk it out with God, you know God is reasonable. I know a lot of people, even in Christianity, but a lot of people kind of preach and teach that, you know, God is just some old man sitting up on a throne just waiting to crush people. He's not. He's really not. He's very long-suffering. He's very... He's actually gentle, I mean, he's actually benevolent, I mean, he's, he has good will for you. That's, again, goes back to why he sent his son. I mean, he sent Christ to die because of his good will for you. I mean, it's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I mean, and he's willing to reason with you. I mean, he's, he's willing to uh, weigh it out, let you weigh it out and, and, and allow you to count the cost. I mean, but I want to... Uh, uh, assure you of something if when you do sit down and reason with God and you do count the cost you'll see that it's worth giving up sin it's worth 
uh, giving up whatever decadent lifestyle you're involved in. It's worth giving up your idols to follow Jesus Christ and to have eternal life. All the rights you, you want, uh, you don't have any less rights than anyone else. I mean, the thing is, the problem is you want more rights. I mean, you want to stamp out those that disagree with you. You want to take those rights away. You want to take the rights of the Christians away. That's, that's what the, the LGBTQ wants to do. They don't want anything, anyone to, to speak out against them. They don't want anyone to disagree with them. Hey Amen. I'm for rights for everyone. You know, God has given us all in, inalienable rights. We're exercising one of those today. Hey Amen. Freedom of speech. You better be thankful. Hey Amen. You better be thankful that our forefathers here that started this country, hey Amen, realized that that was an, a God given right to be able to speak. What's on your mind to be able to speak I mean your opinion even if it offended someone I mean even if it hurt hurt people's feelings that's why it's there that's why it's there that's why the First Amendment is there is to protect offensive speech disagreeable speech I mean I thank God for it I thank God for it even you know if the Muslim was to come down here and preach you know even I, I would vehem vehemently disagree with his doctrine and what he would be preaching Amen. But praise God, he has that right to do it. Amen. As much as I disagree with Black Lives Matter and Antifa, as long as they do it peacefully, protest peacefully, I have no problem with that. Amen. Even though I disagree with what they teach, I disagree with their Marxism and their communism. I disagree with their desire to destroy the, the nuclear family. I disagree with their stance and their promotion of abortion. Amen. But they have the right here in the United States. You better be thankful. We better be thankful our forefathers foresaw that and, and saw the need to establish that and put it in writing that that's a God-given right. <coughs> I mean, they saw the need for this country to serve God. Amen. I those were some wise men. I Amen. And I'll tell you what, if you're really wise tonight, if you really have wisdom, you'll turn from your sins. I Amen. Mean, you'll turn from the way you're living. You'll turn from your wickedness. You'll turn from your unbelief. And I could even, I could just go on down the list, name and sins. But if you're really wise tonight, if you're really smart, you'll turn from that and you'll turn your life to Christ. I mean, you'll turn your life to Him. You'll follow Him. You'll obey Him. I mean, you'll fear God. Scripture says that's the beginning of wisdom, is to fear God. I mean, that's not talking about the... To, you know, to be scared that he's going to crush you. No, it's talking about to have respect and reverence for God. That's what that means. I mean, it's in, that's in very short supply today here in America, including the people who profess to be Christians. They don't fear God. I mean, they don't fear the wrath of God. They don't fear the judgment of God. They, 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 don't, they don't respect the fact or reverence the fact that he is the creator. He created you. He created your bodies. They don't respect the fact that God designed things to be a certain way, that he designed the home to be in a certain order. I mean, he can, he can put some masculinity in your veins. I mean, when God says, uh, the Bible says, when uh, it's actually the Apostle Paul, when I became a man, I put away childish things. I mean, you won't be a beta. You don't have to be a beta any longer if you serve Christ. He'll make an alpha out of you. He'll make a man out of you. I mean, that's lacking in our society today. It's very much lacking. This, this feminism that's risen up, amen, it, it actually attacks men. It causes masculinity. It causes masculinity toxic. You know, the, 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 these men's who, men who invented all these things, built these things, amen, built cars, built roads, built highways, built bridges, built dams, built skyscrapers, uh, built your, your phone that you love to use and type on all the time and look at videos and TikTok all the time. Well, guess what? It's men who did that. It's no slight on the women, but I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you, that's men who did that. And you want to call that toxic? I mean, that's that's pretty wicked, in my opinion, to do that. I mean, God has given men and women certain roles in society. I mean, we're not equal. Now, I'm not saying that one's better than the other, but we're not equal. We're not the same. I mean, our physiology is different. I mean, the way men and women look at things logically is different. I mean, and that's, that's the way God intended it. And when it's put in its proper place, it works great. It works wonders. I mean, it's very beneficial for society. I mean, but feminism today has caused a breakdown in society. We just had four young men that are a prime example of that. 
four boys, I don't know if I even call them men, but four boys, they're a good example of that that were just out here. I mean, that's part of the problem with feminism. I mean, it emasculates men. I mean, some of you men need to man up. I mean, get off the soy. I mean, turn your life to Christ. Do some work. Get your hands dirty. Get some calluses on your hands. You know, uh, lift some weights. Move, move a little bit of weight a little bit. Amen. And be a man for Jesus Christ. Amen. Be a servant for Him. Amen. He can give you eternal life. Amen. I'm glad that I became a servant of His. One time I was deep in sin. I was entrenched in sin. I was entrenched in darkness. I mean, I was wicked. I used to come down here downtown and party with, like many of you do. I used to do those things. Amen. But Christ saved me. He washed me clean. He washed me whole. He washed my sins away. I mean, there's a passage that I, I really, I really love this passage in 1 Corinthians it's six, uh, chapter 6, starts at verse 9. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteous... Well, let, let me back up just for a second. The Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. I mean, so he's writing to believers. He's writing to Christians. He's writing to, to the saints. He says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicator, nor idolater, nor adulterer, nor effeminate, nor homosexual, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. But then he says, and such were some of you. Again, he's right into the church here. He's saying that's the way, the way you used to be. You used to be some of those things. Some of you guys identified as these things. That's what you did. That's what you lived by. That's who you were. He says, but you have been washed. You have been sanctified. You have been justified. In the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So what he's saying, he said, you were that, but Jesus Christ washed you clean. He washed you. He washed those sins away. Amen. He made you spotless. Then he sanctified you. He set you apart from this world. He set you apart from the wicked things of this world. He made you a new person. You're no longer those things. And he made you, uh, uh, he, he justified you. That means he made you righteous. You see, if you are righteous, you can be righteous, but here's, here's the deal. You have to be righteous through Jesus Christ and through the work that he did. Amen. Not the, not the work, work I do. Amen. That's not never, it's never going to make me righteous. As a matter of fact, God's going to see my righteousness, and he, he calls it filthy rags. That's what Scripture says. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. Amen. But when we turn our lives to the one who is spotless, amen, when we turn our... Uh, uh, lies to the one who is thrice holy 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 that's what they're uh saying in heaven today the angels are saying holy 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 he's holy when we turn our life to him amen god makes us holy amen god takes that root of sin out of our lives amen he's the one that perfects us he's the one that cleans us amen that's why if we obey him live in obedience to him we can be clean amen we can be set free from sin amen sin when we turn our lives to christ sin no longer has dominion over you so it no longer reigns over you amen you're no longer a slave to it if you serve sin if you're not serving christ you're a slave to sin amen but you can be a slave to righteousness you can be a slave to holiness amen but that's through the work that christ did on the cross your good works your good works aren't good enough amen unless you turn to christ now, when you turn to him, Scripture says in Ephesians 2 and 8 that we're saved by grace through faith. It's not by works. It's the gift of God. It says, lest any man should boast. But however, a lot of people forget verse 10. Verse 10 says, then we're created to be his workmanship to do good works. Amen. So we should show as Christians, as, as believers in Christ, as followers of Christ, if you've truly been born again, you should show fruits meet for repentance. Scripture talks about that. Amen. In other words, when you become born again, when you when you get saved, amen, you no longer continue to go and partake of those things in which God hates. Amen. You ha no longer have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather you reprove them. That's in Ephesians 5 and 11. Amen. You no longer go to the bars downtown and party it up on Friday nights. It's called revelry. When you do that, scripture is clear. Revel, 
Reveler, revelers. It's in Galatians chapter 5. It talks about the works of the flesh. says they will not inherit God's kingdom. When you get drunk, you'll no longer uh, be a drunkard. You won't have a desire. And you, you, you won't make this premeditated sin that so many of you make each week to go down to the bars and to get drunk. And then to go fornicate. I mean, and then to do wicked things. I mean, he takes that from you. He transforms you. The starting point for the gospel is the justice of God. The fact that God is, and by his very nature, God always does the right thing. Okay, so that is just to get a proper understanding of the gospel. The gospel is not God loves you and has a plan for your life. That is true. God does love you and he has a plan for your life. The plan is repent and believe the gospel. But the gospel itself starts the beginning point, right? You have to have an understanding of who God is. You have to accept the things that God says about himself. The revelation that God gives of his very nature and of his character. What type of God your creator and my creator is. And the Bible makes it very plain that God is a God who cannot countenance evil. God is a God who is extraordinarily intolerant of sin. Many of you will reject this right off the bat, but this is biblical and I challenge you to read the Bible, but God is the most judgmental person in the universe. He's bound by his very nature to be a God who judges sin. Why? Why does God judge sin? Because God is good. He's a good judge. He's a righteous judge. This universe that you and I inhabit is not here for us. It's here for Him. It's not Rich's universe. It's not Rich's world. It's not Rich's city. This is not Rich's sidewalk or university. Right? I'm not even my own person, but Jesus Christ. All things exist for God. All things exist by and for and through and unto our Creator. So to even begin to get a proper picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you've got to begin by understanding who God is. And you also have to understand who God is not. God is not a cosmic teddy bear in the sky who just wants to dump rainbows and jelly beans on everyone and tell everyone to have a nice day. I hope you're uh, having fun in your life. That's not the God of the Bible. You cannot reconcile that kind of grotesque and distorted picture of God with what the Word of God reveals about God. Yes, He's a kind God. Yes, He's a merciful God. Yes, He's a gracious God. But you see, He's not a God who tolerates sin. His very nature prohibits that. God is a just judge. You say, well, what does a judge do? If, you ever, if you've ever been uh, in a court of law, then you know that a judge presides over the legal proceedings of that court, right? And the role of the judge is to make sure that justice is served. That, that is why the judge is there presiding, so that there is no miscarriage of justice, that a person who is innocent will not be found guilty. That's the ideal. And then the converse of that, the person who is truly guilty, so that they will not be let off the hook.